Hello, welcome back for the finale, the third part of our, we still have to find the neologies and what it is. It's uh, basically um, uh, the attempt at the format, which is not a conference, but a flow uh, or a chain. And uh, we are really, really uh, delighted to now have Hala Wade with us for maybe 15, 10, 15 minutes, because Hala, like Marianne, has to move on because uh, her Lebanese pavilion is opening today, and uh, we're very delighted that Hala is here uh, on the day of her press conference. It's really very special. Uh, Hala is uh, an architect, um, a designer, uh, has collaborated a lot with Jean Nouvel, but also has her amazing own architecture practice, uh, and is here at the Architecture Biennale, the curator. I think one of the things which is interesting, it's the difference between the art and the Architecture Biennale, um, that actually very often um, architects curate, whilst it's quite rare that you know artists curate national pavilions. Maybe something to think about uh, why that doesn't happen more often. Because also in the art field, very often the more you know very interesting, relevant exhibition for art history are actually curated by artists. And the architecture biennale very often, actually in most of the cases, even the the director is is an architect. It's just one thing which came to my mind. So Hala is an architect is curating here the uh, Lebanese pavilion. It's a collaboration uh, between many different practitioners. In the center of it all is Etel Adnan, our friend. That's how we met. Uh, Etel is in her 90s. He's a visionary poet and visual artist. And the paintings which are shown in Hala's uh, pavilion are somehow Etel's most extraordinary paintings ever. It's really a chapel. Uh, Etel also agrees that it's maybe the most amazing body of work she, she has ever created. Um, it has to do with her idea that um, we have to have conversations with trees. I also want to mention Tim Ingold's book in relation to that, the wonderful book by Tim Ingold where he writes letters, not to humans, but letters to trees, letters to artworks, letters to, to animals, and uh, letters to plants, to come back to Stefano Mancuso. Um, and uh, this is really a, a, a body of work which documents Etel's incredible relationship to, to trees. She once told me that the day without seeing a tree is not the day. We have to be in dialogue with trees every day. So please give a very warm welcome to Hala Wade and the Lebanese Pavilion. Thank you, thank you, Hans Ulrich, for the in introduction. I was just thinking when you were talking about curating uh, by architects or by artists, um, because I'm also uh, showing some pieces of Paul Virilio, who is, uh, was a big inspiration for me, but he was t saying that um, exhibition is an art, en français, an art révélationnaire, the art of revelation. And to do something in Venice, especially in a Biennale, where there's a lot to say, uh, you have to be at the level of revelation. Uh, as Hans Ulrich was saying, I started this uh, pavilion, it's inspired by this incredible work of uh, Etel, which is a series of 16 paintings called Olivea, Homage à la déesse de l'Olivier, homage to the, um, uh, the goddess of olive trees, uh, that are a series of 16 paintings. Uh, and, um, and she's painted really the feeling of trees more than ex uh, real uh, expressionist uh, trees. And I'm putting this in relation with real uh, trees that I found in the mountain of Lebanon, existing living trees that have uh, lived beyond their uh, own death, should I say, they are more more than 2,000 years old, and we've uh, filmed them, photographed them, and they are so old and so big that they are uh, developed uh, big hollows in their in their own trunks. And these spaces are real architectural spaces. I'm showing this with a work of Paul Virilio's of the early 60s called Les Antiformes. Uh, it's something uh, Paul Virilio uh, 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 theorized a lot this question of void in architecture and um, uh, seeing those trees uh, there is a, a real similarity with this question of um, antiforme the, where he painted the void between objects and defining this as a depth of time. Of course we're talking of long time and short time but these olive trees that we found in this uh, uh, mountains of Lebanon are exactly
exactly the same number of the paintings of Etel, 16. They're called the 16 Sisters of Noah. So this was an incredible coincidence. Uh, why they are called like this? Because the legend says that they are contemporary from Noah's Ark and that the dove that came from uh, to um, say the end of the deluge comes from those trees. So a lot of symbols and uh, uh, of this region. When I told this story to, to Etel, she was uh, really uh, it, it, very happy of this coincidence. So it started with this coincidence. And the pavilion, if you have the chance to see it, shows the pictures taken by Fouad al Khouri of these trees that are really incredibly beautiful. Um, and I've built a little architecture, like a chapel. And I've always wanted to invent an architecture that was born from an artwork and not just to house an artwork. So the uh, chapel that you will see in this pavilion is, is inspired from these paintings. When I talk about void in architecture, it's like silence in, in music or, or blanks in poetry. And these uh, 16 paintings are shown in a, in, a, in a rotunda, and it has no beginning, no end. It's a cyclic, uh, cyclic work. Um, and uh, the, the project is called A Roof for Silence. Uh, of course, all this happened before uh, the, the, the blast of last year, uh, last summer in Beirut, which um, happened uh, in, in, in a second time. But it's interesting to see how I'm talking about cycle and all the revolution that the country has uh, uh, gone through. But uh, it's like when you're catched up by an, uh, your own subject. So the roof for silence suddenly took another meaning with this uh, blast. And you will see I'm showing also on the floor with a, a, a sort of metamorphosis of forms from the imprint of, of the blast through a antiform, a progression of forms uh, transforming into um, a, a, a trunk of tree and materialized by this piece of architecture. There's a film also done by Alain Flecher who came to um, film those um, trees and an in uh, and um, uh, a sound uh, composition by Soundwalk Collective. If you know them, they've done an incredible uh, composition of music on, on the void and on silence. Thank you, Hala. And of course, in the center are these trees. Uh, by I know you have to go, but I have one more question. Oh, is the center of uh, are the trees by, by Etel, and it connects very much with what we discussed earlier with Stefano Mancuso, because of course Stefano Mancuso says that we need to plant how many? A thousand billion? One thousand billion. One thousand billion. Only, he said. Only one thousand billion trees, absolutely. Um, so I just wanted uh, to ask you to talk a little bit more about these trees, because there is something incredible which I, which I think only art can do, which has to do with empathy, no? I mean, there is an incredible relation. If it tells us, you know, we... We have to hack trees every day. We have to have dialogue. There is, yeah, I, I really feel that um, our relationship to trees can change through these paintings. Can you tell us a little yeah, bit more? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I was really struck when you see those trees. They are at the same time you you can hug them, but you you want to go inside of them, and and they are like spaces, uh, I mean, they're the best metaphor of, of, of these spaces that everyone is looking for, especially when you see all this surdensification of cities, of and, and you, you, you always look for places of, uh, of um, moments of um, uh, uh, respiration, and some of those trees, there is one of them that's, that's as big as this um, where we are here. It's so big that it has divided itself in seven different trunks and the village people that are there when they want to meet and discuss they don't go to the to a room or to a, a, a theater they just go in the tree and they discuss or a marriage or there is other ones that are very uh, smaller and you have people of course hiding hugging inside so I think there is there is something about the trees that uh, is uh, should be a lesson of architecture and everything that we want to uh, try to do and and relay this emotion uh, as architects in any building that we conceive. And then there seems to be also silence, and that's my last question, because you gave an interview the other day uh, to a newspaper, actually, where you said that maybe this pavilion is also dedicated to, to silence. 
Yes, I'm, uh, I don't know how you say in English. Je revendique le droit au silence. Uh, you, I think claim, you claim the right to silence. I claim the right to silence. I think you are <laughs> claim the right to opacity. Well, <laughs> and uh, I think it is extremely important, the silence that, uh, the, the uh, the, that precedes the first note of music and that follows the music. It's, it's as important as... Uh, um, um, in, in it's the same in poetry for uh, blanks for you need silence I think then and you need it more especially when you've uh, lived a, a big uh, uh, accident or whatever so I think it is um, uh, roof for silence should be something uh, that we should uh, um, multiply everywhere so this piece will hopefully travel all over the world and different countries to um, relay uh, um, uh, culture, which is everything that is left uh, in our country today. We'll all be there at four o'clock this afternoon, and good luck for your opening. A big round of applause for Thank Halavare. You. Thank you so much. You'll excuse me, I have to And we already announced that we would talk with Joseph, because I think there is such an incredible uh, connection to um, uh, this idea of the non-extractive, which was present, I think, in the previous three or four presentations. Um, Joseph Grima, architect, critic, curator, uh, editor, also urbanist. Uh, most recently, the incredible transformation in Assisi, uh, in making Assisi, again, one of the most dynamic. I mean, when Marinetti said, la Milano e la caffeina da Europa, now with Joseph Grima, we can say, Assisi e la caffeina... <laughs> Europa, uh, memorable encounters with Super Studio. It was actually the last encounter with, yeah, exactly, and with Super Studio. Uh, but today, uh, we're not going to hear about Assisi, that's for another time, but we're going to hear from Joseph about this manifesto. And it's interesting because I was wondering, actually, reading the book, if it is a manifesto or not a manifesto, because it's kind of a paradox to me uh, uh, how we call it, because it's an extraordinary book summarizing possibilities of non-extractive architecture. Uh, but of course, a manifesto is a very 20th century idea, no? of proclaiming something, of projecting something. Uh, it's also, often, um, manifestos are quite loud. So when, uh, you know, Hala talked about, wow, <laughs> manifestos. <laughs> exactly. And it's, you know who is calling? <laughs> this is actually telepathic, because I'm sure he called us for Stefano. It's Carsten Höller. Oh. Yeah. So, <laughs> him on the phone. <laughs> yeah, so the idea of, of silence isn't really in a manifesto, but also Etel Adnan, you know, and that's the connection to, to Hala and the Pavinius. Etel, Etel always said that we should actually learn to listen again. And, that, and, and I think extractive architecture has a lot to do also, non-extractive architecture has a lot to do also with listening. So it's maybe we can say it's a non-manifesto manifesto. A very warm welcome to Joseph Grima. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I really uh, find myself in a much uh, easier position because uh, the previous speakers have ab set up a lot of the uh, problem space that uh, this book and this project attempts to deal with. Um, Stefano earlier was speaking about a culture of of competition versus collaboration, and so to answer your question, um, I, we like to think of it more as a network than as a manifesto, because there are certain things that can only be achieved through collaboration, but we get uh, more towards that. Um, but particularly, I think, um, I think all of us were deeply moved by uh, what Nina said, and I wanted to uh, really kind of try to uh, say a few words about how, in a way, everything is connected, as, um, as you mentioned, because in, in, in economics, in fact, in the theory of economics, there's a word, word called, a concept uh, called externalities, which is essentially when a transaction happens between uh, a transaction or some kind of action happens, when that causes, when that triggers an external cost or possibly benefit, but usually unfortunately cost, in a third place somewhere else to somebody else, that's described in economics as an externality. And I think that what we heard described today was one of the most powerful and moving descriptions and, and relatable, really, in, in a way of descriptions of an externality of 
what we, in fact, as a society produce, like many of the things that we live on a daily basis, are only possible due to the fact that there are communities, there are people, there are territories, landscapes that are paying the price for that in a way that is completely unrecognized and uncompensated. And so if we step back for a moment and we imagine that that was priced in, if we had to take into consideration every time that we drove somewhere in our cars, if we uh, buy something that's made of plastic, if the chairs that we're sitting on had to embody the cost to people and to territories of what it means to extract that oil, to extract the, the, the polymer, to produce the polymers, all of the consequences of that, of course, what is today widely used because it's so cheap would no longer be cheap because, of course, you'd have to be going through an extra, extraordinary amount of, of trouble. So all of that to say that uh, if we're going to actually do something about it, it's not simple as simple as saying, you know, we need to be sustainable and so on. We actually fundamentally need to rethink and retool the way we live. And so the problem is actually, it, it actually the, the brutal reality is that it's not possible to reduce it to any single action. Uh, it requires a fundamental rethinking of the way we do things. And so we, as um, uh, an architecture studio, as people who think about the built environment, wanted to specifically look at this relationship between building and extraction, extractions, de uh, building's dependency on extraction, and to really question whether there's an alternative. So the subtitle of um, this book and project is Designing Without Depletion. Um, and uh, what we're really trying to, the question that we're really trying to ask is, is it possible, are we actually, is architecture fundamentally condemned to exploitation, to depletion in order to exist? Or in fact, if we take a step back, if we actually really get far enough away from the problem to look at it in its full complexity, and we sit down as designers to essentially design, redesign design, maybe we can actually arrive at some kind of uh, solution to this. So this is where we come back to uh, Stefano and I think this idea of a species that is in evolution. We are not the same thing that we were 100 years ago, we're not the same thing we were 200 or 1,000 years ago, we're in continual evolution. And I think one of the things that modernism has brought to us that the, the, the past century together with the kind of um, technological uh, empowerment, the ability to affect change on the landscape, and knowledge of how we can um, really uh, transform environments around us, is a certain idea of architecture, uh, which we see in the great masterpieces of the 20th century, which are fundamentally dependent on concrete, for example, the plasticity of this material, the incredible versatility, the cheapness, and so on. And that was what made really our culture of the past century. And, and, and that's not to, so in, on the cover of the book you see a photograph by Armin Linke of, um, of Mies van der Rohe's pavilion, which in a way is, a uh, Barcelona pavilion, which in a way is an emblem of a certain idea of architecture, this heroic architecture with a deep sense of poetry. I mean, it's one of the great masterpieces. But we would argue that is not the architecture we need today. We need to move beyond that. We need to learn from it, understand it, get all, not, not necessarily repudiate it or reject it, but also recognize that it's problematic. And the architecture we need, if we're going to exist on this planet, is not an architecture of competition, of heroic, uh, largely, um, uh, you know, kind of centralized power of, uh, of the architect as we understood it in the kind of Ayn Rand fountainhead model. Um, but more an architecture of collaboration. So again, going to back to, the, to this idea of replacing the kind of competitive spirit that animated so many of the architects that we glorified in that period to an architecture of networks, of collaboration, of contributing different forms of knowledge that don't pit us in contrast with the environment, but as Nin described, in a way, make us an integral part, a, a one with this environment. So in a way, the, the, the book is... Um, uh, I think in common with the manifesto, it raises, it, it, it kind of raises the, uh, the, the question of what a goal, a common goal could be, but it doesn't prescribe a specific path towards that. It simply invites a number of people to reflect on what needs to be done in order to achieve this goal of designing without depletion. Uh, and it allows for the possibility of a, a kind of a pluralistic approach to this, that it may need, it may require different things and different approaches in different parts of the world. So, uh, in a way, it's uh, a, a call to action without prescribing what that action necessarily needs to be, but simply to reflect on that. And I, the one thing I would add is that um, this is volume one, uh, and so therefore it's a, a kind of attempting to, and it was done over the last year, and 
situation of lockdown that we all know. Uh, and now we're very fortunate to, uh, to be collaborating with VAC here in um, Venice at Palazzo Lezzatere. So tomorrow we'll be uh, moving out there and also on Saturday to go a little bit deeper and more specifically into um, this question um, to develop volume two, which will be much closer to a handbook. So we want to look at a theoretical level, but we also want to really look at it at a much more practical level and not to let the question sort of slip through our fingers and remain somewhat abstract. So in fact, inside Palazzo del Lezzatere, we've set up a workshop uh, where we are actually experimenting with materials. We also have some contributions and uh, experiences coming from Atelier Luma, for example, among many others. Um, and what, one of the things that we, uh, is a kind of a premise of the project is that this very problematic situation has arisen because these externalities often exist beyond our line of sight, beyond the horizon, they're happening somewhere else. And in the moment when we began to become a little bit more um, bring the uh, full spectrum of uh, activities and of um, material production and, and so on closer to home, we suddenly become much less uh, 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 um, prepared to begin pulling things out of the ground and uh, pulling our hills down and cutting things down because that affects our own environment rather than somebody else's environment. So we're also kind of, as a first step, advocating a shortening of supply chains, an attempt to become a little bit more uh, self-sufficient and to not um, dream an architecture that is dependent on externalities. So in a nutshell, that's uh, the project, and it would be fantastic to see you all at uh, Palazzo Lezzatere. Thank you so much, Roosevelt. I just thought to um, add maybe one more thing, because this was such a uh, great summary, but <clears throat> it would be good maybe if you give us one example, because if, uh, part of your practice has always been to basically research architects at the beginning of their trajectories, uh, you worked with architects like Frida Escobedo at the very, very beginning when there were still students. Um, and I was kind of wondering now that you're in this research of the non-extractive architecture, if you can maybe give us one or two examples of concrete practices of architects whom you feel are exemplary in the way they address this in their work. That would be, I think, very useful. Absolutely. I think um, it's... Uh, um Thank you, because it's also an opportunity to speak a little bit about um, the nature of the book, which is in fact a polyphony of voices um, coming from different um, uh, backgrounds, different fields. We also have Emanuele Cocha speaking from the point of view of philosopher about what it means to uh, relate between species and to design for different species. But uh, one of the architects who I'd um, like to name is, um, who contributed to the book is Charlotte Malter Baths, who's a, a researcher and academic, um, but also a designer of uh, maps and of systems of representation. So in this book, um, so Charlotte actually is working on an amazing uh, project right now called a moratorium on building. Uh, and that's a kind of a paradoxical thing for, apparently paradoxical for an architect to be working on, but of course uh, we know that Cedric Price was um, uh, really seeing far ahead in that sense, building only when it's absolutely necessary, when it's kind of the, 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 the last resort of the architect is to build. Before that, there should be many other options. So uh, Charlotte is working on this amazing project, of which is again a call to action uh, to, for a global moratorium and building, where uh, building is put on hold, precisely due to the um, consequences that most, the building as we understand it today is, um, is happening. Uh, and in the book there is um, a kind of an analysis of uh, why this is necessary and there's this beautiful drawing um, in which she takes a, a small, kind of the most simple, uh, most elementary form of architecture, which is a dwelling, a typical kind of dwelling in Switzerland where she lives, and explodes it in uh, the tradition of Morphosis, who did these beautiful analyses of breaking down the dwelling into uh, individual elements. And she looks at this exploded view of the dwelling and the extraordinary complexity and, and, and stratification of materials that often are actually mandated by code. So there's this paradox that our legal systems actually mandate a, a, a system of production that is fundamentally at odds with the necessary necessity to, um, or the idea of sustainability in its most um, uh, essential sense. Um, and, and, and so that kind of becomes a, a, a way of expressing the, uh, the deep ramifications, the way that any, even the most uh, elementary form of architecture in fact is connected to so many different places and so many different materials and so many different supply chains, all of which make it very difficult to actually have any sort of sense of the consequences of what you're doing. That's one example. Um, 
Another example uh, could be the work of uh, Lucas Wegworth, who's a, a, a designer, um, who actually was, uh, he was based in the Netherlands for a while, his um, uh, German background. Uh, but he, um, I mean, he, he makes these amazing modular systems where, uh, in, in essence, things can be used and reused infinitely. But the thing that, and, and his work in itself is incredibly int interesting because it proposes an a, a, a form of design that never becomes obsolete, that continually be reused, continually readapted. But what I think is most interesting and touching about his work is that he, in fact, um, noticed in his hometown where his grandmother lived this incredible abundance of wood from the Black Forest that was being cut down and just left to rot because, you know, there was no market demand. It, wasn't, it was inefficient from a market perspective to do anything with this wood. So he decided to move back there. He uh, took his grand, the, the barn that he inherited from his grandmother. He started to store all of the wood inside, set up a logging um, operation, essentially, to capture all of this wood, uh, bought a saw, began to cut it into planks, season it, and to essentially provide for the whole of the village around him the building materials that otherwise were coming from Siberia, from logging active forests where people are actually living. The kind of absurd paradox of that being more uh, efficient and from a market, from the point of view of the marketplace, than actually taking the wood that's already there. So beginning to do what I was saying before about this idea of reducing the, the, the length and the scale of um, production of materials and architectural level. And there's lot, a lot more to say about Lucas, but I think these are the kind of architects that we need. This, this is what we should. And most of this project is really actually about offering to young people. The young people are the, 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 those who are the students today are the solution to this problem, essentially. I mean, there's nothing that we, I think, uh, my generation can really do about this other than legitimize a different idea of architecture, to give models and uh, alternatives to the heroic figures that we've inherited and to make that, uh, that, that position one that's viable and accepted and not kind of complete continuing to replicate the Mies of uh, the past. Thank you so much, Joseph. Big round of applause for Joseph Grima. And actually, it's interesting because it's uh, the perfect transition really to not uh, Vital, because not you have been working with non-extractive architecture, um, parallel to um, your art practice, you've early on ventured into architecture. You've done many buildings, very often built uh, locally, uh, invented whole new forms of, no of non-extractive architecture. But today, you actually are going to tell us about uh, mutual aid and also what you do with your school. And, uh, uh, and I think you've uh, prepared a, a presentation on that. But maybe before that, it would be great to hear a little bit about uh, your exhibition in, in Venice, which opened last night, which we also all have to visit, because we, are, we just heard about uh, what Joseph is going to do tomorrow. We heard Hala's Pavilion. Um, we all have to go and see your show in San Giorgio. Can you tell us a little bit what we can see there? Yes. Hello. Oh, this is so heavy, <laughs> this microphone. <laughs> no. Um Yes, uh, um, I wanted to do, I always wanted to put a building in a building. It's kind of like putting a boat in a, in a bottle. Um, so um, this building that I did now in San Giorgio is actually going to an island in the South Pacific. It's a building to watch the sunset. And this island I got in the South, South Pacific, I bought it because I wanted this island to stay as it is. It's an island that uh, is inhabited only by birds. And uh, of course, they would have made probably a hotel out of it and, and so on. Um, yes, scarch is like what I would like to talk. It's, uh, word put together out of two, it's sculpture and architecture combined. Uh, and because I'm a, I'm a sculptor. But also sculpture in a very broad sense, or architecture not in a conventional way, where I, I'm not an architect, I never wanted, I didn't want to study architecture. Uh, it's like I didn't I know how to use permits, plans, plans and I don't want to use cement either, uh, but it was, I was, have been very interested since I'm very young to try to build my own habitat uh, and then also not to build at all. I remember when I was three years old, 
uh, there was so much snow in my hometown that my brother, brother and I, we built a tunnel. And he went to school and I could stay in this tunnel alone. And I still remember the, the smell, the light, uh, and also like I felt very cozy in it. And I stayed in there for many hours. I, di I, wouldn't, I would refuse to go in the comfort of my parents' house. I would stay in this small hole. And I think then, I've, that's when probably I started to know that I have to build my own habitat. At the same time, I would not eat. I would refuse to eat. So my father was making houses out of bread. He made like he carved, he carved um, towers out of cheese, and I would eat the towers because I liked the towers. I didn't like the cheese, right? So like ever since, I've been interested in building also these towers. I've been doing a tower in in Zeus. Uh, out of one piece of, of marble, eating inside the tower. There's one in, in Belgium and so on. I want, actually, I wanted to talk more, if I would have given a title, would have been like smell, eat, and make architecture disappear. I live in the Engadin Valley, which is very, very beautiful. It uh, has attracted over, over so many centuries People like Nietzsche, Segantini, uh, uh, Boyce was there, Nijinsky was, uh, did his last dance in the Engadin. And so it attracts a lot of people. Now, uh, people also start building in this village. I mean, and unfortunately, what they built are imitations of the most beautiful architecture, alpine, more, maybe more intelligent uh, alpine architecture, and they made this monstrosities, which are like, really like ghost towns around, uh, around the villages. Not enough is that these houses are, for 50 weeks a year, they're empty. So we have to look at it. So what I did in the park is to try to build a, a building that by remote control, it comes out of the ground and you press it again and it disappears, right? So if people would come over the mountains, they could press a button, the house would appear, and then when they leave, they could do the same thing and it would disappear, right? So I build this thing that goes up and down. Uh, and it, it, will con it would conserve energy. We would not have to look at this. And also, deer could walk on top of the houses without knowing that they're wa walking on top of the building. In the late 90s, because I tried always, I've been always building things, because uh, in the Engadin, we only had to go to school seven months out of the year. Five months, we were off. So you can imagine as children, what did we do? We, we lived in the trees, very much like the Korowai people in Papua or something. And, um, and in the 90s, I smelled, in Romansh, in my mother language, you can say, if you want to go someplace, you smell where to go, no? As a Vureva, the deer in Africa. So I went to Niger. I knew very little about this country. I knew almost nothing about the city of Agadez, but I knew that there were people, they're nomadic or semi nomadic people, and I was interested how would they build if they built something, right? So as soon as I arrived there, I felt at home, built my house, and also built seven rooms next to it, because I wanted to share this beauty with my friends. But my friends never came. So like it was, I, I could sleep every day in another room. And since then, I have this thing that I, I cannot, if I have the possibility, I don't sleep in the same room. Next to it, uh, Niger is the, among the poorest country, countries in the world. So I don't have to describe to you the school, which was right next to the house. I just counted the children. So like what I did is like I built a school for them. Uh, and it was like a theater where the children could sit on it. And there were 150 children. And there were four sides. And depending on the light and the view, here it is. Here is 150 children, right? I mean, they, they were like... Uh, but what happened in no time is the next photograph. Yes. This school disappeared. 
from 150 children, suddenly there were four times more children because it had attracted so many people that the school became something different. It became a sculpture. So this is what I like to do. What I like to do is like that this is actually a sculpture. It is architecture, but it's also, also the most important thing is maybe the social aspect, right? This is one thing about eight in Africa, because like people come to me and say, wow, you're a really good person. You go to Africa and build schools. No, I don't do it. I do it for myself. Uh, because I cannot, I'm not an architect, but I would like to build a school. But I don't know how to do it. And I couldn't do it in Switzerland. I couldn't do it in, 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 in Europe or America. But in Africa, I have the possibility to do that. Uh, and and this is what is great, I think. Uh, if you have the feeling that you want to go and give, Nietzsche once said that friendship is not giving. Friendship is more taking. And this is what you have to do if you want to do something like in the third world. Is you have to go, go there and get it. So what these children gave to me, they were able to turn the school into kinetic sculpture. How great is that? You can even go further. There were 55 workers that worked, so like, and they don't leave. They're all there, always there with you, because of course they need work, but also they, they become part of it. These buildings made out of mud, they need the people. They need, after the rain, you have to, re, uh, you have to do it and so on. And so uh, 55 workers in, in, in Agadez cost as much as an electrician in Switzerland at two and a half hours, okay? And these 55 workers, their community is a thousand. So what you can do, as I, I think it's so, I continue, I went outside of the town, it was so hot, it was unbearably hot. Uh, me coming from Switzerland, I'm not so used maybe to heat. But like I had to build something for myself to, to live because it was unbearable. So I built this building where you, it cools you off, yes, this cools you off, but at the same time, it also protects you from sandstorms. And then we built other uh, buildings out of mud, like watching, the, watching the, uh, the, the sun. And also this one, because I think that for me, being in this country, the most amazing time was when the sun set. That was like am amazing. I've never seen anything like that. At one point, I, uh, I write that uh, sunsets are so enormously satisfying because they're quick, they're colorful and intense, very much like a crime. I mean, so I was like, I had to be every day, I had to be like at that time of the sunset, it became something very important. So I had to build a tower to be able to see the sunsets over the, go over the, uh, over the trees, because it's in an oasis. So I said, okay, we have to go up 13 meters. And the worker said, il a perdu ses chèvres, meaning he went nuts. That's impossible, you cannot do that. Never in West Africa has been a building built this tall. But we were able to do, because I think it's also important to give them a challenge, uh, that uh, we build this, and. This tower is only held up by these three stairs. And it's all the, it's, it, for some reason, it's all about 13. It has 13 stairs, 26 steps, 39 stair, steps, and so on. And so the top is where you can see the sunset. But it was also built actually for that. But now it's where I live because I gave up electricity, I don't need a toilet, and all this, what I built in the first house in Africa, is irrelevant, right? Uh, when this was finished, I realized that actually this is in itself complete. It's kind of pure. You cannot add anything to it, you cannot take anything away. So I thought like I should build one of these on every continent, because it, it was the time of the, uh, the invasion, it was war, and the Americans have uh, military um, bases all over the world. So why can I not do a house to watch the sunset on every continent? So I did this in Agadez. Then I went into Brazil, built one there. One is built in Switzerland. And this one, which is shown at this Biennale here, 
uh, goes to this island in, uh, in the South Pacific, in Tonga. And, and that's it. <laughs> Hans Ulrich, um, uh, th thank you very much, not Vital. I think this was um, also a very interesting contrast because you can see that the, the man in this case, but the human in general, but maybe there's also a gender difference, wants to build, right? So it's something that you basically, there is a, um, a cre uh, yeah, there, there is a um, will to create that can become a big problem if you scale it up. Imagine everybody would build houses to watch the sun, then probably we couldn't watch the sun anymore, like in Dubai where I spent the last three weeks on the 48th floor of a building, overseeing the whole city. And the interesting thing is that the sun went down every night behind a cloud of smog. So you wouldn't see the, here Noah, uh, Noah Rafford is here the great uh, futurist, and the head of the Future Foundation of Dubai, and he was actually many of these evenings with me. And it's really crazy because you watch the sun, how it goes down, but not behind the horizon. It goes down behind a layer of smog that is produced by the city. The city that is built and that is producing through the building processes the smog. But there is still in our you know human um, in our human motivation we want to build we want to create we want to participate and we want to transform joseph grimmer in your book i read the quote of ayn rand from fountainhead and it's a very beautiful quote actually from a certain perspective it's a quote from the protagonist standing in front of this mountain and he wants to transform it and uh, he wants to change it and he wants to take out the minerals and he wants to produce and he wants basically to transform the earth and he wants to become maybe through this process of transformation a part of it. But what this protagonist cannot see, and you said it a few times in your speech, uh, it's out of sight. He cannot see that this giant mountain is not endless. He cannot see that this giant mountain is a part of an ecosystem and if you zoom out, you see how fragile it becomes. This is the earth rise moment. So this is the, the, the problem of being out of sight, that we don't really understand what we are doing, that we are not really able to see what we are doing. And we have here, um, and, and this is how I'm slowly coming to you, Cecil, but before we are coming to you, because you are making processes visible. You're making exactly like Stefano. Um, Salome Rodek, you are researching to the great Lynn Margulis and James Lovelock. Could you give us a short point of view on the hypothesis of Gaia and how this is relating to exactly this change of perspective from the perspective of, you know, being a creator to the perspective of being part of a creation that Lovelock discovered together with uh, Carl Sagan's wife Lynn Margulis? So, James Lovelock was working for NASA for, um, to look at other planets, and they were trying to find out, this was in the 60s, and everyone was uh, obsessed with going to Mars. And, um, like today. Like today again, yes. And um, he, he was, he's more of an independent scientist and an engineer and an inventor. And uh, he, f he had this device to detect um, the gases of other planets. And so he said, look at Mars, the atmosphere there is in complete uh, equilibrium. There's nothing, there's not much there. It's just a few gases and they don't really interact anymore because like the chemical process, they're done already. Um, and then look at Earth. And just by looking at the atmosphere of the Earth, you can see that something's very different here. And that thing that is different here is that the Earth has life on it. I'm not, I, don't, I always hesitate to say it is alive because... Um, People like to anthropomorphize quickly, but um, there is life on it. There's living creatures on it that produce gases, like plants, of course, they use oxygen. Um, Lynn Margulis came in being a specialist on bacteria and really stressing and really being able to go into the deep history of the planet and saying, look, it's actually mostly bacteria that do a lot of this stuff. They produce methane, they produce other sulfur, they produce a lot of gases. And um, they came together working 
um, in, in the 70s and um, created this first a hypothesis and then they developed it into a theory um, which said that all these different organisms doing basically their own thing, but they kind of come together in many different systems that get coupled into larger systems that create feedback loops that in the end extends to the whole um, planet as one system. But um, I wanted to say that I think it's really important and it's something that Margulis really stressed is it is very easy to go from thinking about this one system to talk about holism and a holistic image. And I think it's we have to be careful with that because there's downsides to really always go to this simplification of that is one big unity. And I think the important message, especially of Margulis, that she really stressed over and over again is there's may, there is a hyper, a hyper text maybe that is um, a oneness, but really it's about the complexity and the interconnection and codependence and um, these kinds of things um, that that matter and that we have to think about. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, this is uh, definitely answer. I mean, the, this is obviously the topic that um, that of the different scales of perspective, um, and maybe we we sometimes cannot see many of the scales. So when we create, when our creative process is basically uh, happening, we just uh, uh, destroy things that we can see, right? We are basically, you know, like the famous elephant in the porcelain shop in the, in, in the how do you call it, in the... Do you mean the bull? Yeah, 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 exactly, the bull, yeah. Uh, yeah, and and we, we are a little bit like that, and to to see this complexity of life, to... Um, incorporate it into our design processes can be something because if we look at nature, Joseph, uh, nature is growing, transforming, terraforming our planet, but it's not going to the worst, it's going to the better, right? So it doesn't mean that we cannot build, it doesn't mean that we cannot create. The question is only do we create and build with the right understanding of the natural processes and opening our eyes, uh, this is exactly what Lynn Margulis did, but this is also what many artists are able to do. And uh, I don't know, Hans Ulrich, if this is the moment where we want to hear Rafik uh, first, It maybe? is absolutely the moment. However, yes. I have uh, one more Lynn Margulis related question to you, which sort of is something I actually wanted to ask in Berlin, but then we run out of time when you did your great presentation. And for all of you, you know, who you want to know more about uh, uh, Lima Gouris, you should look at the archive of the Berlin Conversation because you gave such a, you know, detailed and complex speech there, uh, uh, focusing on, you know, why Lima Gouris is a toolbox, no, for for our time. But what we didn't discuss then, and I thought it would be interesting, particularly because he, you know, last week Maturana passed away uh, in Chile. And of course, uh, Maturana and Varela, I never met Maturana for long. I only once had a phone interview with him, but I was very good friends with Varela in the 90s in Paris. And they, of course, came up with this idea, which is also very relevant in terms of what we're discussing, of the autopoiesis, right? And uh, in the obituary, um, I reread actually the Guardian obituary of, uh, of Lynn Margulis this morning, there is reference to Maturana Varela. And it says that the whole idea of autopoiesis was actually somehow influential on the thinking of uh, Margulis' you outline. So I just want to ask you to tell us a little bit about that, because I think it would be a nice way to pay tribute to Maturana, which has passed away. Yes. Um, so Margulis was really... The, I mean, this was in the 60s, and a lot of people were very interested in cybernetics and systems theory. Um, but there was a, a specific brand of um, systems theory, I guess, that uh, Maturana and Varela, um, as biologists, uh, were talking about, and really rethinking what an organism is in, in terms of um, systems theory. And I think Margulis also really adopted their um, position talking about Gaia, um, like that's what Margulis did. She used this concept that they use for to describe organisms to um, talk about Gaia because Lovelock, especially in the beginning, liked to say that Gaia was like a living organism. And she did not really like this a metaphor that much. Um, so instead she used um, their idea of the autopoietic system, which is a system based quite simply that um, 
maintains its own boundaries. Like it can, um, ha like any human body, we can uh, maintain our own temperature, for instance, and the amount of water we have in our bodies. That's like stuff we don't even do consciously, of course, but that is what an autopoietic system is. And um, she liked to use that um, to describe Gaia really to get away from the kind of popular science that was attached to Gaia very quickly that really deified it basically and, and attached it to the, to the meaning of the word Gaia which comes from Greek mythology and where it's the earth goddess or the earth mother. Um, and I think what is so special about Gaia and Margulis's take is that Margulis was really a very rigorous scientist. She really wanted to stress that this is science and that this is that they have facts and that they have um, a lot of um, theories to support what they're saying. And it's not because they, of course, they got so much resistance from uh, from many scientists who said this is all complete crap. Or they said, well, this is something we already knew and you're not bringing any new perspective. And I think by ad adopting these um, ideas by Maturana and Varela, I think um, she was hoping to get a, a certain scientific backup to the Gaia theory that was really needed in the public perception of the concept. I just wanted to react to something that you said the entire time. That's why I'm just pop popping it in right now because we often hear about Gaia that it's, um, and you mentioned this as well, that um, nature is about cooperation rather than competition. And that's something that Margulis brought to the table. And I, it's really important to me to remember Margulis um, as someone who was very specific about wordings and about how to talk about these things. Um, and I think she would have answered, and she liked to fight, of course, she liked a good scientific debate, so I'm in the spirit of channeling that. <laughs> um, I would say that I think nature is about competition and cooperation, and these things are not even two ends of a scale, but they're happening all the time. They're, they're like life and death. These things are intertwined. When our, the bacteria in our gut, they help us. As soon as we die, they devour us. Like that's, that's how quickly <laughs> it is. Um, and I think it's important that when we talk about biological findings and about these ideas like symbiosis and Gaia, um, really, we have to use human vocabulary. And um, that is limiting us. You know, we can say these like mycelia and plants, they help each other. We could also say maybe they steal from each other or they harvest each other. This completely changes the narrative. And I think it's important to um, remember that the, the vocabulary we use is really important, but it's never dictated by the science. The science has to just as well use vocabulary that, that is at hand. And I think if we wanna go from a paradigm that overstresses competition, as social Darwinists did for many years, um, to one that maybe overemphasizes cooperation sometimes. And that is fine, um, but it is a political act. We do it consciously and we do it because we want to save ourselves and um, not necessarily because science dictates it, but because we really want to go in that direction. I agree with you that nature is competition as cooperation. I disagree with you that they have exact value, the same value. And, uh, and I discussed it with, uh, about this with Lynn Margulis because I, I think that the, the, the point of view of biology is not that one of plant. So this is the point. When we study biology and when we study evolution, we never look at plant, mostly. And plant represent, as I said, almost the totality of, of life. So we have a, um, let's say, a, a, a wrong perspective on life what we say, we normally, we, uh, um, let's, let me put this in, in, in other words. What is working for animal, we normally uh, took as a general rule of life. And whereas plants are just, whereas animals are just really irrelevant in terms of quantity of life. Whereas when we, uh, on the contrary, uh, what is happening 
in plants need to be confirmed in the uh, realm, in the kingdom of animals before becoming general. So from this point of view, this is the only point of, let, let's say, disagreement. Because in, in, in plants and overall, when there are stressful conditions that are mostly, most of the time, the, the, the cooperation is a stronger, uh, a stronger uh, and I, I agree with you that we can, uh, talking about cooperation is just a popularization of what's happened. But we need, we, sometimes we need to use uh, popular terms because on the contrary, it's very difficult to understand what we are saying. I don't, I don't even think we are disagreeing. As, I mean, especially thinking of Margulis, she was so um, outspoken about that evolutionary theory is basically only built on animal theory. And of course, being a bacteriologist herself, she was like, most of these, uh, these concepts that you have, they don't apply to bacteria. Bacteria are wild. They, you know, they don't know sex in the way that like the gender sex, they don't, they don't. They reproduce. They, they reproduce. <laughs> they do, you know, they have just a completely different way of being. They share DNA in completely different ways um, than, than animals do. Um, I think my point is just, um, and I think Margulis knew this, that she had to sometimes overemphasize cooperation to get the message even out there. Yes. Because we need strong messages, and she knew this. Gaia is a very strong message. Big narratives is what people, you know, it's, it's easy or it's, it's easier to think about our own relationship to Gaia than to sulfur fixing bacteria in the in the soil you know we need some we need bigger stories to connect to and i mean the the, the, the theme of this entire um uh, biennale is how do we want to live and i think she really wanted to emphasize it is super important to think with bacteria about these things but in the for the sake of um maybe me being a literary um scholar going into history of science it's still something we have to be aware of the kind of that these are metaphors, and that this is language that we're using, and um, these are political acts. But it's a very uh, so the metaphors become uh, alive uh, for themselves because you mentioned something super interesting. I don't know if it was '58 when Maturana and uh, Varela published the radical discourse of constructivism, and they introduced the concept of autopoiesis. And then it was the young back then mathematician Hans Otto Peitgen that proved it with with the first software program, basically how systems are. And this is how I wanted to do the. Uh, actually uh, to, to introduce Rafik because, because it's very interesting how our words become an own reality that is actually mirroring nature. So you have indeed uh, this concept that Maturana, and I had no idea Hans Ulrich that he died last week, this completely, I mean, he's uh, you know probably with the concept of self-referential systems, one of the ground layers of the internet and artificial intelligence as we know it today. And this became a system that was first developed to represent nature, and now it is representing itself, right? Definitely. I mean, first of all, I'm extremely honored and deeply happy to be here together with wonderful minds and souls. So, um, excuse my excitement, because I'm really deeply honored to be here. We are very excited. Big applause. Um, uh, the, the topic and the discourse and context is incredibly aligned with what I would like to share today, maybe machine. And, and in, in, I'm honored to be in an exhibition together with uh, Hashim Sarki's um, invitation. And we are we produce a piece of artwork in the um, second Arsenal, second bay. Um, and it is living with other beings. But the, the being in the installation is not um, a, a living being, maybe. It's a machine learning algorithm generated uh, by using 4,500 people's neural activities using a human connectome data. This is one of the world's largest information, represents our mind's connectivity. And to achieve this project, we have been closely working with neuroscientists to understand what does it really mean to perceive a context between human machines and environments? And how can we contextualize art, science, and technology? The piece is a representational of a physical sculpture uh, produced by a recycled plastic PETG and produced by a large-scale robotic um, sculpture. 
while we are maybe in the, in the next slides, I would like to quickly show you this piece. It is a just a very high level um, physical experience. But during the six months, we will be able to produce alternative human connectomes, which in the next slides we can see in a couple of more, please. This you are seeing here is, doesn't belong to one person. It belongs to most likely our collective memories and consciousness. It's a representation of a, a near future speculation that what will happen when we see a space and what will happen when we perceive these problems, depth, and all these things we are discussing at the end achieving our consciousness. It's one of the things that we couldn't achieve to scientifically prove yet. So I don't think we should very quickly fear about what happens if a machine becomes consciousness. I think we first, as humanity, define what is consciousness. So, but before it, perhaps, there's another space in our minds that can become something else. So we are trying to speculate a context called sense of space. What happens when we sense a space or a nature, our collective memories? Uh, in our next slide, we are also exploring this interconnectivity between our mind. For example, when a problem appears, conflict appears, dreaming, remembering, learning, hallucinating, that is all human context of understanding life. And can we represent these moments in our mind in the form of a space? Can we also speculate metaverse, alternative dimensions that, I mean, right now in quantum physics we are talking about you know, things that we can't even perceive. In AI research, it's called latent space, a space that we can't even perceive, 10 to 24 dimensions. How on earth architecture can talk about, or write, or draw a um, plan or section of a dimension that doesn't exist in our physical world? So I would like to share today, because all these problems, all these very important conflicts or perspectives, eventually achieve in our minds, and maybe this is a piece that represents our diversity, our unique perspectives. In a couple of more slides, um, I would like to show you one more, please. So this AI will be, during the Biennale, will be generating every day one unique space, and each will be different from each other, and they will survive in metaverse, which we cannot perceive, but they will be in the mind of a machine. And end of the uh, Biennale, if you go one more, please, uh, this each sculpture will be tagged by AI and will be a representation of how will we how will we do it together with maybe also machines. I believe that if we detach ego from data, we have a chance to look at collective memories, time, space, and of course today nature. And perhaps machines can give us a new perspective that may be a much fresh than we all collectively couldn't achieve. Perhaps objectivity may come from AI that perhaps when we use it purposefully, we can get an impactful outcome. So the piece represents these thoughts that I think between humans, machines, and environments, we can generate new living beings. And if you go one more, a couple of more, please. The piece generated by this uh, robotic um, arm, and it will be generating this over the course of six months. And at the end of the Biennale, I mean, if you go there, oh, sorry, next one, please. Yeah, these are, for example, all artificial uh, human connectome uh, spaces. Each connects to different regions of brain, represents different thoughts, problems, and hopefully dreams and memories. You can go several more, please. And this will be, over the six months, will be constantly evolving with our hopeful discussions, memories, and dreams. So thank you for this. Thank you so much, Rafik. And when we did the studio visit, I, I made a studio visit with you. Uh, I, it wasn't possible over the last couple of months to do physical studio visits. I started to do a lot of Zoom studio visits. And I was very grateful to visit your studio by Zoom. And we had a longer conversation there about data, no, and how big data uh, and art can be connected. And uh, you, you somehow talked about the data set you use within the work, and you seem to be particularly drawn there to data sets somehow connected to nature. Uh, so maybe it would be interesting to hear a little bit more uh, why, and also um, to, to hear about some of the other data sets, because there are also wind patterns, there is temperature, there is also air quality, there are Wi-Fi uh, wi signals, there is Bluetooth, two signals, and then of course, last but not least, 5G. Good. Um, so what was really inspiring in the, in the Biennale time, um, the question was, we are living in an age of machine systems and hardwares and softwares that we are constantly asking our free will, and of course our fresh perspectives are constantly evolved by the machines for society, I mean, common of society and humanity. So I think the invisible patterns in life, 
first of all, data can also become a memory, a memory of a nature, a wind pattern, temperature, cloudiness, air quality, and so on. So the question is, can we use machines to remember or dream in this like kind of a poetic ways of understanding those patterns. So during the Biennale, we are recording the Venice uh, six months long uh, wind patterns, um, environmental information that as much as we can get from, from the airport especially, there's a beautiful uh, station, and then transform them also, infuse them into this sculpture you will see in the Biennale when you go there. So the patterns you will be seeing on the brain is kind of sensing Venice as a, as a, as a space, um, so the Bluetooth signal so far in the Arsenale is also sensed by the same brain. And the Wi-Fi, that if it's used, also sensed by brain. Imagining a future that we are all sensing each other, hopefully, <laughs> but can we also simulate sensing in a different context? Um, Wi-Fi, uh, 5G or LTE, um, environmental data will be also reflected on the sculpture. Um, the algorithms allowing us to do these kind of speculations, and I do believe architecture can hold these ideas, and I think light is a beautiful, and I mean, we need the white pavement to survive and the nature to survive, and the question is, can also architecture use light as a material and data as a material and machine consciousness as a narrative to grow spaces that doesn't exist but may exist? Thank you. Now, one more question. Um, is a question really goes back to Joseph Grima, no? the idea of uh, non-extractive uh, architecture. And I kind of wanted to kind of ask you this in relation to technology, because obviously we always and often, you know, wrongly so, associate these um, uh, technological, basically, possibilities with them being immaterial. But obviously they are not, as we know, and there are deeply material processes behind them, which very often are actually deeply connected to extractive processes. Thinking, for example, about the uh, often absurd energy consumption of, um, of the blockchain. That's just one example, no? But also thinking about materials uh, used for digital devices, no? For, for smartphones. Uh, many of these ingredients are deeply connected to extractive economies. So, kind of Coming to the end of today, I was very curious um, how to address that and how you address it also, how, how you can somehow think about non-extractive ways of using technologies. Uh, I know that you're, for example, interested in green blockchain, uh, so I thought it would be interesting because we haven't really heard about that today in our, in the meanwhile, almost it's becoming a marathon today. So yeah, that's my last question. It's, it's, it's an incredible point of view because I think we are talking about nature and the sensitivity for humanity to how to like survive our future. And it's clear that at the meantime, certain um, people in the world is imagining new ways of distributing wealth and information such as blockchain. And I'm practicing in this scene and understanding many perspectives. There's ways of doing very horribly to na that damage nature, unfortunately, but there are people who are investing ways of doing like called proof of stake, which is like maybe thousands of maybe less than a, a, a traditional blockchain may harm the future. So I'm practicing also in NFT space because we should, if architecture is discussed and you know, uh, speculated in this space in Venice, I think we should also recognize that there's a significant amount of people trying to find meaning in environments that doesn't physically have the you know, concrete glass or steel. There's a metaverse, which is, as you mentioned, which is now explored, but the question is, can architecture embrace this new environment by being sustainable and careful? Unfortunately, NFT space sometimes is using techniques that are harming nature because nature of like um, mining process. But there are people right now extremely working on how to use the same concept, the feeling of ownership through these new ways of doing that or sharing, but not harming nature, which is called proof of stake and different ways of using blockchain environment. So able to say that that's working. Uh, and there are very brilliant people trying to make that new movement very brilliantly green and safe. So I'm a part of that also group, so happy to share more if anyone has questions. So there's hopeful, there's optimism there when it's used purposefully. Thank you so much. Super, thank you so much, bravo. I, I, I think what, what I'm like observing how, uh, how more complex um, uh, technology becomes it seems that technology becomes more and more uh, developing towards nature. 
but um, becoming more and more imitating and mirroring and biomimicking nature. And we have now uh, here somebody, um, and uh, this is basically um, our big, big honor to welcome again Cecil Tolas, because she's actually one expert of this connection. She's an expert of how you can actually access nature through technology, but in a careful and non-extractive way, more in a way that we will discuss uh, tomorrow also uh, in the VSC Foundation with Joseph Grima in a regenerative way. So regenerating nature through technology, this is one of many topics and accessing through this regenerated nature our deepest emotions. This is again one topic that we had already with the Danish pavilion and you are doing this like you are creating basically poems of smells that are accessing our, you know, our um, brain much faster than any word could do and with, I think, also much uh, deeper meaning. So, uh, please, a big round of applause for Cecil Tolas. <laughs> Resurrecting the Sublime, this is the title of your work that basically, when you... It's your collaborative work, this is absolutely true. Please tell us more about the collaboration. Collaborative. Competitive, collaborative. But first, I want to take on a journey. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Close your ear. I close my eyes, but the ear, I still hear something. <laughs> Breathe. Open your nose. Breathe. Mm. Earth molecule. Bacteria. The first way of communication on planet Earth. Through smell molecules, long before any word, any other tools, chemical communication happened between bacteria, between bacteria, insects. Geosmin is the earth molecule that is produced by bacteria to attract other insects in the earth. And this bacteria is very efficient in many, many ways. Not only have a lot of people now experienced that working in nature, with nature, back to earth, down to earth, have also psychologically a big impact on behavior. So not only have we connected with nature during pandemic in a new way, but also science in the field of molecular structure and chemistry have understood this, this need. So geosme is an amazing molecule, what you just smell, causing the smell of earth. And it produces serotonin in the brain, and it is also proven to reduce stress and anxiety. So I think there are a lot of dimensions there to be discovered underneath the surface. So this chemical communication happened between not you know, bacteria, insects, insect, human, human nature, is happening all the time, full time, all the time, between humans. We know who we are, where we are, how, what's going on, long before we see it. And we then immediately start to make sense out of it. But we don't really act according to what we understand through smell. Because the, in the discourse, intellectual discourse, the emotion is something that are neglected. Most, most cultures in the world, except for you know, when we really look into people who live with nature, live with the senses, all alert, and using the senses for what they are meant to be there for. You know, we are born with these amazing interfaces called the senses, and it's not only five, there are multiple under, you know, under, under the five, there are multiple others, other nano level of all the senses. So I think it's, you know, we're looking at the world, we are seeing it, you know, we're seeing it things, you know, and we don't understand anything. We are tired of looking, you know. What happens when you start to smell? You engage with the topic of concern, activating your memory, activating collective memory, if that's the topic, and your emotion. Emotion is, is, is very, very important for action. Reaction and action are connected. And if you don't get the message by sensing it yourself and letting it go through your body, nothing is going to change. So change has to happen from here to there, and then it will happen both ways. Scale down to scale up is necessary here, you know? Really go down, start with smelling the earth, and then slowly build up again. So yeah, that's what I do. 
25 years of rediscovering what life is beyond looking at it, you know? Literally becoming an animal, whatever that means, you know? I can smell your excitement here. I can smell your pain, my dear friend. <laughs> <laughs> I made cheese of his forehead bacteria, and it's stored at Trinity University in Dublin. James I didn't know Joyce that. I didn't know that. <laughs> no, but I think it's... it's but also not. Olafur became... You yeah, also Olaf made cheese. Yeah. Yeah, Michael, yeah. Michael Pollan, Bill Ooh. Gates, Zuckerberg's nose, etc. But that's, uh, you know, another way of telling a serious story. And back to bacteria and microbes. Yeah, it's not... A, it's just we have to change the rhetoric. We have to change how we talk about this. Isn't, and also, nature don't exist in the rhetoric of your culture, you know? How can we talk about this issue of concern if we perceive the information through other senses than looking at things? I think that's the biggest issue here. Language, you know? Learning how to create new language, new codes, phonetic codes. I do a big research now on how do we express emotions by smelling reality. There are hardly any language. I'm curious to talk to you about that. But I have discovered, because smelling is so quick, it bypasses rationality, immediately activates emotion and memory in the brain. So when you react, you express phonetic sounds, paralinguistic sounds. And if you start to compare all those sounds, I do a big research project in China and Norway at the moment, these sounds are identical, you know? Smelling earth in China and smelling earth in Norway, they expect exactly the same phonetics. Amazing, you know? So, yeah, back to Venice, architecture. Architecture is packing air, the air we all breathe. We share and care the air, yeah? And in our little setting, which I somehow tend to see as a floating diorama, you come through the central pavilion and you're taken on a journey driven by how things look like. And you enter this amazing end of the pavilion and there's this object sitting there, just on its own, just floating in the air. No, that's a, don't forget those. That's a, done before anything else. But anyway, come to, to the central pavilion if you like to. <laughs> No yes. force here, but, but anyway, so we have done uh, a very interesting project, uh, to make a long story short, started in uh, 2008 uh, with Christina Gapakis and myself collaborating on skin bacteria, how to take away the kind of negative, the kind of rhetoric around, you know, smell, body smell, language, etc. So I challenged Harvard Synthetic Biology Lab, I said, listen, what if we just become basic? Why don't we just start looking to what is actually bacteria? How do we speak about bacteria? And in the context, back to what you said, you know, kind of context of, of language, we tend to say, oh, bad and good and yes and no and dislike and like and metaphors. Yeah, but there are much more. How can we show that bacteria also have a positive purpose? So that's where Hans Ulrich's skin bacteria come in. It's like, yeah, let's make celebrity cheese of a human bacteria. Maybe. That changed the language and make people understand that, you know, if we use skin bacteria to produce food, maybe that is the way to go. Maybe that changed the discourse. And I think exactly that's what we need towards climate. That's exactly what we need towards nature. That's exactly what we need to change. You know, we need to change the rhetoric about what we do, how we do it, and how we gain information about the topic of concern. Yeah, so the resurrecting the sublime. Started with the cheese, and uh, <laughs> Christina Gapakis was studying synthetic biology and microbiology at Harvard Medical School. And we took each other on a journey. I understood, uh, started to learn synthetic biology, she started to learn chemistry. So, collaborating over the years, she then ended up doing a very interesting project. Also, I must say, maybe having the chance to work with artists and creative. The way I did it also challenged her as a scientist, like, yeah, where do I actually place my science? You know, it's nice to do things in the lab, but what kind of relevance does it have to reality? So working on the cheese project, taking her out of the comfort zone, really, I think, broke the ice for, for, for her and many of her colleagues at that very moment. I think that is exactly what we need. Collaboration is not only about 
making commodity and product, but also a lot about process and learning, learning from each other, being nature, being other human, being whatever. So anyway, this um, resurrecting was uh, starting, uh, did start at the lab, a Ginkgo Biotech lab, Biowork lab in Boston, where Christine Alkapakis were able to so to, to, to collect segments from uh, extinct plants at Harvard Herbarium. And from these segments, she were able to sequence the DNA, grew the DNA, and the, the grew tissues out of the DNA. And on those tissues, there suddenly started to develop smell molecules. So I found this stunning. So I reached out to Christina and said, Christina, why should this amazing way of re-understanding what's happening with extinction be, you know, remain in the lab? Why can we not take it out of the lab and show it to the world? So this is the beginning of resurrecting the sublime. Daisy Ginsberg got on board and off we started an amazing journey. And when the molecule was detected, all the data then was sent to my lab in Berlin. It was a chemistry lab, smell molecules, 25 years of archives. I reconstructed, started to reconstruct the smell molecules from these extinct plants. We have three in total, and the one on display here is hibiscus from Hawaii, got extinct 1912 due to colonization, cattling and deforestation. And so, the molecules on display is a chemical communication between molecules. There's not a constant smell. It's literally still going on. The chemistry is still going on in the vitrine. So in the vitrine, you have uh, stones, mar uh, uh, volcano stones, uh, that are references to the volcanic landscape in Hawaii, where the, where the plant got extinct. And you can sit on the stones. Um, the, the vitrine is designed by Daisy. And uh, we have animation um, landscape in the background. And you sit down, and the stones hurt. It's hurting to sit down, because volcano stones are very sharp. So you sit down, and you close your eyes, and you smell this chemical communication between the molecules coming from the ceiling. So you're taking on a journey, uh, thinking about extinction, extinction part of evolution. But not only you are observing and testing your emotion towards these kind of issues, but you put yourself on display and let other people observe your skill to show emotion. So it's like a double meaning of extinction. So for me, it's very important. Working with smile has so much to do with what it means to be humans. What differentiate us from, from, from the machine is still that we have emotions. And humans were intelligent to, to create the robots, but the robots have still not been intelligent enough to create the humans. So I think we should try to, try to preserve this, what it means to be human. And the sense of smell is the only thing left that is not digitalized properly, and the only thing left that activate the emotion the most efficient way. So there's so much argument for really investigating into the sense of more properly if we are going to change in, in all, all its, uh, you know, all the issues we have been concerned about today. So I hope the smell of earth can activate some action here, yeah, and reaction. And uh, yeah, you know, I'm very passionate about life and all my, what I do is living and observing what life means from all its perspectives, yeah? And uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing when you start to understand it, not just by looking and talking, but just, just observe the smell of the space you enter in the architecture in this case. Yeah, somebody had been there before me. What had that person be eating? Who was he in bed with last night? Or did he, you know, did he do this, did he do that, you know? And that starts to kind of bring other dimension into what it means to be, you know? And I think these are very scaling down. And I think it's a good moment now. We all have understand how invisibility can close down the world, yeah? And yeah, yeah wow, who am I, you know? Why am I here, you know? What does it mean to be, you know? What is breathing? What is disembodiment? What is, you know, sense deprivation, you know? We all know, oh, I don't have a sense of smell anymore. What was it actually? Did I have it ever, you know? So all this 
substantial questions. I think it's so, so important not to lose the momentum of having gone through this pandemic altogether. You know, let's, let's use the pandemic as a starting point for change, you know, start, start to change within ourselves and then, you know, we take on the rest. I mean, there could not be a more wonderful conclusion, really, of, uh, of this whole day, uh, because also we are ending on, a, on an amazing experience, uh, thanks, uh, thanks to you. I, I just wanted to maybe ask you one very last question, which is, because I'm very fascinated by that, because, you know, we followed your work and seen your work in so many constellations, in, in group shows, in, in, in exhibitions, collaborations with architects, uh, collaborations with, uh, with artists. Um, and this is a very important moment uh, mm -hmm. for you because besides, of course, the collaborative work here in, in Venice, you are opening in a few weeks this um, first really big solo show, museum solo show, survey show of your work at the Astroferni Museum in, in Oslo. Now, I was very curious how you're gonna deal with that? How will uh, a big solo show of, of smell work? And, uh, and also, I'm, I'm curious particularly because for me it always resonates with Margaret Mee, not the anthropologist, who once wondered, many, many years ago in the 50s, she, she wondered why actually people don't spend more time in front of artworks, you know? And you see it, I mean, you see it here even at the Biennale. You see it in every single exhibition here. You know, there are very complex video installations. There are display features. There, there are texts. Uh, but people just sort of run through. They, they really don't spend much time in front of the data, the information, the knowledge, the, the, the experience, the artwork. And Margaret Mead being asked, you know, why this was the case, wrote this text where she basically said that it has to do with the absence of a multisensory environment of exhibitions. It has to do with the fact that exhibition mostly, you know, fish for the eyes, uh, sometimes for the ears. And, and, uh, and that basically uh, this absence for, of a multisensory environment doesn't create a binding. You know, it doesn't bind the visitor. Whilst a more multisensory exhibition, you know, Margaret Mead quotes rituals, you know. She quotes a ritual with, uh, she quotes a Bali ritual and she quotes also you know, um, uh, European medieval rituals uh, where people spend so much time in terms of a multi-sensory activation. And she emphasizes, you know, the absence, of course, of, of smell. So I'm very curious, you know, obviously people are going to, yeah, how are you going to do it and how are you going to bind the viewer? I, I started with placing, placing, placing some of my work in the mask of people, you know, in the mask. Yeah. That's the beginning. But anyway, so... The way I, I have approached, in this case, Oslo, first of all, Norway have locked down. One of the richest countries in the world have been able to vaccinate one percentage of their population, not five million people. And they are so paranoid. They are so afraid of everything. Uh, you know, virus, people, and, and so on, support. So, you know, it's hard to really, you know, get anything done, uh, you know, it's whatever that means. So I was... For the first time ever, uh, since I got the invitation to do this solo show, I was uh, in Oslo last week in quarantine. So they invited me to come to Oslo. They found me a flat five minutes away from the museum. I was allowed to walk from the flat to the museum, see nobody, and walk back to my flat. So, you know, just, just, that's just a kind of metaphor, yeah? And uh, the same when I arrived here and was observing the first day, 50 visitors, 250 guards, police, literally looking if people were wearing masks or not. So I decided to start to educate the police. So in our booth, where it's all about smelling and, and sitting down and doing all these forbidden things, you know, like, you know, so I said, but without opening up the mask, I, I can go home. Yeah? So the police, I took the police in, put them down on the stone, and said, just lift a little bit, just lift. So one after the other, and then one told the other, and then suddenly there were 10 of them there, like lined up. It's like, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, I got it. Oh yeah, it's not that dangerous. Well, actually, you can just lift a little bit there, and then you lift a bit here, or you lift up there. And it become this incredible ritual, you know? And now, when I was there yesterday, it's like, oh, Miss Tolles, how's it going? And there were people in the booth, and they're like, oh, we didn't see it, you know? So. 
I just started to approach Norway with you know, policy making and, 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 and the government and trying to figure out what, uh, you know, what, are the, uh, what are the rules here? Why are you having those strict rules? And why are you not you know, accomplished to, to get things done more efficiently with all the wealth in the world? You know, what is wrong? So suddenly, you know, I was able, by having a conversation, was able to get permission to turn the museum upside down. So the government said, yeah, we have no clue how we're going to allow you to do what. So, but we can allow you to literally tear the building apart. Yeah? So I'm turning the inside wall outside. So literally the art or whatever will be there will be accessible all the time. Yeah? And uh, they are, the, the designer from Phantasma is doing the exhibition design. So we are investigating into the building as biology and literally yeah, taking it apart and using the ocean to come into the, in, it's on the harbor. Renzo Piano is shaking in his bed in Italy. He's like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's having a hard time, but he said, yeah, it's up to you what you want to do. So I'm trying to make sense out of it, you know, and, and hopefully, uh, yeah, we have amazing plans. Yeah, opening the roof, and, uh, you know, there was never daylight in that museum, suddenly, you know, because art should not be in daylight, so suddenly, no, you can lay down and look at the sky. Yeah, and the, and the, and the whole museum is like an oil platform. It's built on, uh, yeah, so we are opening up underneath, etc. Cecil, thank you so, so much. A big round of applause. <laughs> and I think we've reached the beginning of yeah. our next panel. Yeah, I, t I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a deconstruction of a museum, I think, what, what, what you were just summarizing. And I think the deconstruction of a lot of architecture is probably the most constructive thing. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Hans Ulrich. Thank you very much to the panel. I think it was, it, it, it was a research, it's a research lab that we have here. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, Thank you, Mikolai, and thank thanks you. again to our speakers. Amazing speakers and thank you all for being here.